Today we're going to be talking about growing roots and growing towards God. And children, the reason there wasn't a children's story today is because there's going to be lots of stories during the service, okay? So stay, stay tuned. <coughs> roots and trees. Can you see beautiful deep roots? This tree is growing by the water, so its roots haven't gone very deep. But if you look at this tree, you'll see that the roots underneath the ground are about as big as the roots on top. And so that's what happens in dry weather. In dry weather, the roots have to go very deep to a place called the water table. Have you heard about the water table? That's the, like it's underground rivers underneath the ground. So even in dry places like Port Augusta, there are um, deep, deep uh, underground rivers and that's where the, the trees will tap down to in order to stay alive and healthy. In Psalm chapter 1 verse 4 it says the one who delights in God and his teachings or the law as it says is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields fruit in its seasons. My question for you today is how are people like trees in the way that they grow? And there are three things that we're going to look at today that helps people to grow. What do you think the first one might be? Thinking about the previous one, what do you think the first thing is? We need nourishment. We do need nourishment, and that's number, my number two. First of all, I was thinking water, because if we don't have water, we certainly are, are going to dry and droop. Now, I picked this out of the garden this morning. And when I picked it up, it was attached to the, to the branch and it was looking quite healthy and strong and uh, alive. But a few hours later, it's been disconnected. There's no water or sap and it's looking pretty sick. So people need water. We cannot do without water. Every living thing has to have water. And what happens when plants don't have water? They die. they die. Did you know that our body is 60 to 70 percent water? Our blood is about 90 percent water. Our muscles 75 percent water. And even our bones are 25 percent water. So if we're not getting enough water, then our body's going to feel weak, our bones are going to feel weak, and uh, as well as that, there are many different things, many different diseases that water helps. It doesn't necessarily cure it, but things like lower back pain, headaches, allergies, arthritis, depression, neck pain, joint pain, low energy levels, stomach pain, confusion, often these situations are improved with water. But Jesus says something interesting about water in John chapter seven. He also talks about water. Knowing that people needed water in those days, he, he provided a spiritual lesson from water. And in John chapter 7, verses 37 and 39, on the, great, on the last and great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, streams of living water will flow within him. By this he meant the spirit whom he believed, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So in this verse, we often hear in the Bible that oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus actually said water was also, the Holy Spirit was also like water. If we don't have the water, we're going to die. But the Holy Spirit is also known as the helper the comforter and also the helper. And so we're going to see this morning the way that the Holy Spirit can be a helper to us. Just like water helps us when we're feeling thirsty and tired and exhausted, the Holy Spirit can also be that same helper to us. Now, back to our question. How are people like trees in the way that we grow? We've talked about water and then somebody very, very well said we need nourishment. Now this picture 
is a picture of a little girl that I know who was born three and a half years ago, but she came a bit early. And so this little girl was only about this tiny when she was born. This is Hannah. And uh, she was nine weeks too early. And to start with, she needed to be hooked up to lots of, uh, lots of things. And you'll notice there's a tube that goes into her nose. And that was called nasogastric intubation. It meant that she was getting tiny drops of food through her nose because she couldn't take it into her tummy to start with. She was connected to nourishment for the first little while and then she was able to start sucking and then she could get the proper nourishment from mummy and now there's nothing stopping her what she eats. <laughs> but all of us, when we start to know Jesus, when we start to be a Christian, we're a little bit like a helpless baby. We don't know very much, but that's why we depend on other people around us to help us. We depend on the Bible. We depend on God to teach us. And uh, we're very grateful when the nourishment comes and we start growing. And now today, you'd never think that she had such a, a um, difficult beginning. And so for some of us who are new Christians, don't feel badly that you don't know everything. None of us know everything, but we grow little bit by little bit as we spend time praying to God, reading from his word. It helps us to grow um, just like a little baby like this. There's another thing that we need. We've said we need water and we need nourishment. And something else we need is other people in our lives. And in Proverbs 27, 17, it says, just like iron sharpens iron, if you want to um, sharpen a knife, a bush knife, you need one of those rasp things, two bits of iron together to make it sharp. So one man or no, one woman sharpens another. So this is telling us that we need each other. We can't just live by ourselves. Whether we're a parent, with a young child, whether we're grandparents, and there's a lot of grandparents here today. How many grandparents are there? Okay, this, lots of you, half the congregation are grandparents. Okay, so this, this little worship service today, especially for you, because the younger generation need us to encourage them, to help them, to mentor them. And we have a beautiful passage in 2 Kings 6, and I'd invite you to turn to it if you have your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 6, where we're going to look at the example of a wonderful mentor. He was a teacher. I don't know whether he was a parent, but he had a special way of dealing with people who could learn from him. Now this, this story, typically we know it as the floating axe head. That's what, we, that's what we know this story about. But today I want to tell you that something more miraculous than the floating axe head was the way that this teacher was able to interact with his students in beautiful ways, ways that we can all practice, whether we're teachers or grandparents or parents with young children. We can learn from this beautiful um, chapter. Um, just a few verses. And chapter 1, I mean, verse 1 in 2 Kings chapter 6 says, The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet is too small for us. Let me just set the scene a little bit. This was a group of young men who went to live with the prophet in a, on a, in a, a I was going to say a plantation, but a, a small area. Um, and they had a house there. We don't know whether it was temporary or permanent accommodation, but apparently it was too crowded and the building was too small. And these fellows, these young men, these teenagers perhaps, they, they were talking amongst themselves and they said, we're too squished, we're too squashed. We need, to, we, need to, we need another place, we need a bigger place. And they talked amongst themselves, but they didn't talk among themselves very much because they decided to talk to their leader, the prophet Elisha. Now, the question is, not every leader likes to be told when there's a problem. What sort of a leader encourages people to share their thoughts? So this was a leader, he was the boss, he was in charge, but these 
teenagers felt comfortable enough to talk to him. I want you to, to this is a, a service that you can give some answers from, the, from, the, from your seats there. What kind of a leader do you think is one who encourages people to share their thoughts and share, their, share if there's a problem? Could you tell me? What sort of a leader? Uh, yes, he is a good one. What makes him good? What are the characteristics? Caring, yes. Loving, yep. What else? He's wise, and what makes him wise? When somebody brings an idea, does he say, no, silly idea, or does he? He listens. He's a good listener. He's approachable. They're willing to come to him with, with their problems. Now, not every leader's like that. Some leaders, if you're unhappy with him, you just have to keep your mouth shut because you know that he's going to really get angry. But this one, no. They, they knew that he was approachable and he would listen, so they were comfortable enough to come to him. And they said, in verse 2, let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to live. Now, not only did they tell Elisha that the place was too small, that was the problem, but they also came with a solution, an answer to the problem. Now, does every leader like to hear an answer to the problem? Or do they like to think that they've got all the knowledge, that they know everything and you know nothing and I know everything, yeah? Lots of leaders are like that. But this leader, this mentor, this parent, if you like, was not like that. So he was someone who was listening, he was approachable. And um, in verse, chapter th verse 3, it says, Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? And Elisha said, I will. Now just imagine for a moment, this leader, this teacher, is running a school. There's lots of students, and it's too small. And then the students say, hey, why don't we go down to the river and cut some more trees? Now, if I was the teacher and I was exhausted, I might say, yeah, that's a good idea. You go and cut the trees and I'll have a holiday. Do you think some leaders might do that? I think they might. But what, did, what about this leader? He said, yes, I'll come with you. So what does that tell you about Elisha? They looked up to him. They wanted him. Yeah, they loved him. They loved his company. And what about Elisha? Was he happy to go with them, even though it meant more work? Yeah. So Eli... Sorry? He was. And each, each of these verses provides a beautiful example. Yes, well, he might have wanted to, to oversee how long the timbers were to be or whatever, but he was happy to join them. It wasn't on his agenda for the day, but when they suggested it, he decided that he would come. And in verse, chapter, verse 4, it says, And he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down the trees. Why do you think Elijah cho Elisha chose to go with them when he could have had a day off? And I think um, Betty already answered that question. He loved them. He liked their company. And he saw this as another opportunity to, to teach them wonderful lessons. And so he was happy to go. And they began to chop down the trees. Now, it doesn't say the teenagers started chopping down the trees. It says they began to chop down the trees. So do you think Elisha was one of the choppers? I'm sure he was. So although he was a teacher, he was also happy to get his hands dirty and his back bent as they chopped the trees together. Now, verse 5, as one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. <gasps> oh, my Lord, he cried. It was borrowed. Why do you think the student turned to the leader when he was in trouble? When kids are in trouble, do they always run to the leader? Lots of times they run away. Why do they run away? They're scared. They think they're getting, going to be shouted at. 
they think they're going, somebody's going to say, you fool, what did you do that for? Why didn't you check the axe head? You know, you saw it. It's a, a thing that can come off if you're not careful. Why didn't you look after it? Why didn't you check it ahead of time? But it's interesting that these students knew their teacher and they knew what kind of a person he was. He was approachable and so when something went wrong they were happy to go to him for help. And in verse 6, the man of God. That's interesting. It doesn't say Elisha at this point. It says the man of God because the way he answered and dealt with the problem was like God deals with our problems. The man of God asked, where did it fall? Now that's interesting. He didn't say, why didn't you check the axe head? He didn't say, you fool, why did you borrow it in the first place? In fact, he didn't concentrate on the problem or why the problem occurred. He just said, where did it fall? He was looking for a solution. So we as leaders, as grandparents, as parents, as as mentors in our family, people that our families look up to. When there's a problem, we need to focus on the solution, not just the problem as it is. So when he showed him the place, in verse 6, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float again. And we've already discussed how the prophet helped. And then verse 7, lifted out, he said, then the man reached out his hand and took it. Now this is an interesting part of the, the last question for this passage. Why didn't the prophet provide the entire solution by himself? Why didn't he go and say, you silly fool, here, I'll have to get it out and I'll give you the solution. Why didn't he do that? Why did he say to the man, here, you lift it out? He wanted him, yes, he wanted to teach him. He wanted, Betty? It was something they could do, yes. So he was what we call empowering the person with the problem. He was helping the person with the problem to be part of the solution. So he wasn't a know-it-all leader. He wasn't someone who was up, on, up high and looking down on these silly young teenagers or whatever. He was happy to work with them to help provide the solution but also he empowered them to do similarly. So Elisha is the mentor or the teacher who supports. You'll notice and the seven points that we got from this story that first of all he has a good relationship where the opinions and ideas of the other ones are respected and valued. He's an older person who is not threatened by bright ideas from the younger generation. He's willing to learn, even from young people. Number three, he was a leader who was willing to join his students in some physical labour. He was a mentor whose personal presence was valued by the students. The students just loved to be with this man. He was dependable and a supportive person who is able and approachable in difficult times. He was a problem solver who concentrates on the solution and not just the causes. And finally, a leader who seeks to empower those in his sphere of influence, even in times of crisis. What a beautiful story from scripture that teaches us so many beautiful lessons of how we can best develop and encourage those around us. To finish our service this morning, I'd like to share with you, that was a that was an old time story from scripture. I'd like to share with you a modern day story of a wonderful mentor who I met about six months ago when I was in New Guinea. And this is his story. Gideon was a, a graduate from our college in Papua New Guinea. And when he graduated, he was called to be a district director. Now this is an area, this is the land that he's looking after. Usually district directors are called to a place because there's lots of churches and there's many pastors and then he looks after them. But when he got called to this place, there was only a few church members, there was one church and there was no house for him to live. 
So what do you do when you're called to be a worker for God and you haven't got a house and there's not many church pe people? What do you do? Well, he started praying. And this is his story, working with God. He was someone who enjoys God's company. He likes to stay connected with God. And so he prayed and said, God, I want you to give me direction and help. I don't know what to do. I want your Holy Spirit to speak to me and to direct me. He wanted to, um, this man was, was someone who practiced good stewardship. He realized that everything that he owned belonged to God. And so he decided that in order to build a house, he needed money to build a house. And so he decided for that first year, he wouldn't take the wages that was deposited in his bank every month. He decided to leave it in the bank. And then when he purchased timber or cement or screws or nails, he would take the money from the bank and pay for the timber. So for one whole year, no wages. But how do you live when you don't have wages? Well, you make a vegetable garden, and in the process of making the vegetable garden, he taught other people how to make vegetable gardens, because in that area, they were now used to eating just rice and maybe tin fish or tin meat. And he thought, no, we can, we can also build a, make a garden and, and build good food. He also, so this was how, this is what he did. He built a church and built a house and district director, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And in the process, he connected with the community, just like our story this morning about Dorcas, how she looked, looked after the needs of people in her area. Gideon, Pastor Gideon, started looking around the community and finding what needs there were. And in the process, he wanted to work, just like Elisha did, he wanted to work with the new congregation and help them to be Christians and, and to teach them about God. And as well as that, there's lots of criminals around there. He wanted to rehabilitate the criminals, help give the, cr the criminals um, courage and encouragement and help them um, to choose a better way. So all of these things. Now, this story is hard to tell because all of those things are happening at the same time. It's not as though he spent six months building his house and then he did this and then he did this. He was doing all of those things at the same time as he prayed and connected to God every day. Well, this is the house that he built. Now, he's not a builder, but he found a, a laborer who had helped build another house and together they got the plans for a house and together they built the house. You'll notice there's some garden growing there. This is part of the garden they built. And uh, when you'll notice the size of the cabbages down the bottom there, huge. And uh, this is a group of ladies, that Dorcas ladies, that have harvested some things from the garden and have been going to feed sick people. In the process of the things that they were doing in the community, a few people were... Um, showed their interest for God, they had studies, and were baptized. This is the rascal group. Now, in New Guinea, when we say rascal, we kind of mean criminals who um, look for ways of stealing things and taking things and whatever. So this mentor got close to these guys, and he said, we could use your truck every Sunday. He said, why don't you come and help me with my building of the house, I need some big rocks from the river. He knew that they would, they would go, you know, if, if these idle young people had some strong work to do, that that would keep them busy. And so they were happy, they used the truck. If you can, you probably can't see it too well, but they've got a lot of string and chains keeping the truck together, you know, to keep the door on and to keep the, the, the what do you call it? the bumper bar there. You'll notice there's no windscreen except a little bit of glass in one corner. I mean this truck is falling apart. But every Sunday they would pray and ask God to keep the truck going and they'd go to the river and they'd collect the rocks and they would um, help build. Now of course when you're working hard you need to be well fed. And so he got people in his, in his church to, to feed, to, to make a good meal for them. And uh, so these boys were happy to work every Sunday because they would get the best meal of the week. 
um, from this wonderful pastor that they loved working with. Well, in 2012, there was 48 people that were baptised. In May of this year, there was another 75 baptised. And in September of, and October of this year, there was to be another 200 to 300 extra people that were going to be baptised in this area. This is the picture of the ones who were baptised uh, in May 2013. Now, this is another interesting thing that he did. When he first went to the church, there was only a few members there, and um, their tithe for a year was 7,000 kina. If you divide by two, it's approximately Australian dollars. So like 3,500 Australian dollars and 3,000 dollars for offering was what the whole district got for a whole year. And so he came along and said, I think that our goal for 2012 needs to be $50,000 for tithe and offerings 40000 for offerings. Now, what do you think the people thought of that? Betty, what do you think if the pastor came along and said, all right, 10 times more than we've ever got before for Port Augusta? You'd think he's being crazy, yeah? You'd think that's impossible. How could you ever do that? Because there was really only three businessmen in the area that had these little shops that were mostly going bankrupt. And, you know, there really wasn't a great source of income. But he prayed, he, he prayed with his, his, uh, his church members, and he told them how that God wants to multiply whatever we have in our hands. However small it is, when we give it to God, he will multiply in ways that we could never even imagine. He started teaching um, so the, the three guys who had the shops about returning tithe on any income that they made and how God would bless their, bless their, their, um, their businesses. Because tithing and offerings isn't about God needing our money. It's really like God saying, hey, I own the universe. I've got all the resources there are. So I'm inviting you to be a business partner with me. And whatever you have, if you share it with me, I can share with you my blessings. So it's really a one-sided thing, isn't it? It's not the little bit that we give. It's the big bit that God wants to bless us with. And that's what tithe... It's a little bit like Sabbath, too, because when we reserve one day for God out of seven, he blesses all the days. And so... Can you imagine what they got for tithe and offerings last week, last year in this church? Do you think they reached the goal? You're, you're people of great faith because, yes, they did reach the goal. The tithe they got, the, the, the goal was 50,000 and they got 53,000, and the offering was 40,000 and they got 43,000 from this tiny little place. These people who were being baptised and learning about God, learning to pray, learning to, learning to read their Bibles, learning to share in the community. Uh, that's another picture of the house. And this is the, the guy who's the assistant. I mean, neither of these people are really qualified builders, but they, they ask God and the Holy Spirit every day to help them in this project. And as people were baptised, they were encouraged that they were saved to serve, saved to help other people. Well, they heard that there was a funeral. And this wasn't a funeral of people of their, their clan, their tribe. This wasn't their, their, um, their tribe, it was another tribe. And usually tribes of one clan don't go and help tribes and clans of another kind. Yeah? They usually do their own thing separately. But these people said, no, we love Jesus. We're happy to help even people who are on, of a different clan. And so you can see some of the, uh, some of the food they harvested. They uh, chopped firewood. It looks like they're going to battle, but it, it's not. They're just carrying firewood. And they walked. I'm not sure how far they walked with their heavy loads of food and firewood. When they got to the top there, they started building fires to cook the food, but also to comfort the sorrowing, especially. And they did it by bringing food. And then when it came for the, um, the coffin, they, because they had their Pathfinder uniform, the village people said, please, you be our 
pallbearers because you look very smart in your uniform. So this will be a special funeral because we've got visitors to help us. So that was the funeral. Then they looked around and thought, what are, what are some of the other needs that are around? Now, not far from the, this man's house, there was a high school, a government high school. They had 800 students, and the students just got two meals a day. The first meal was white biscuits and a hot drink, supposed to be Milo, but mainly water, and maybe the water was a little bit dirty with Milo, but not a, not a full, nutritious kind of hot drink. And the second meal was white rice with occasional meat. And so once again, they said, we need to feed them. Now, they decided um, ahead of time that next Sunday, we're all going to get together, and it was about 120 of them now in this church area. They said, we're going to feed 800 students. Have you ever tried to feed 800 students? Growing teenagers, growing strong teenagers. Well, it, as you can imagine, it was quite a, quite a job. They harvested the yam and the sweet potato and they started peeling them. And then they, they uh, built fires. Some was for baking them, like baked ones in the stones. Some they got the big cooking pots to boil them. They got lots of greens from their garden and washed them and cleaned them ready for cooking. Then they made the moo moo, cooking in the stones there big lot for 800 people and then they started filling the saucepans and they needed 38 big containers to feed the 800 students there they are gathered outside the district director's house uh, and all the all the bowls praying for the food and asking god to bless it and to nourish the bodies of those who would eat it. And then they put it on their heads and they started walking. And I think it was like two or three kilometers that they had to walk with this heavy food to feed the students at the school. There they are walking past the garden. You can see there's still food in the garden, even though they've harvested a lot. But of course, he was teaching his church members how to grow food as well. And God was blessing. And uh, there they are carrying it up the road towards the school, and then went, they got to the school, and there's probably the principal, I think, very happy that here's one time when they can really give some good food to the students. There they are, stirring it all, happy students and uh, workers there, and then you can see how much they get on their plates. Quite a substantial amount. That will last for a day, I would say. <laughs> and... Uh, they were very excited. Now, guess what happened next Sabbath at church? Can you guess? There was extra people there. Some of the ones who had been fed the, the week before were now coming to church. It came to church because they wanted to know who were these people who were being so caring. They weren't related. They weren't one talks. What do you say for Aboriginal? What's the word for family or close, is there one word that you use? In New Guinea we say one talk, but I don't know. Sorry? Nangani. Okay, yeah. But these people were from a different tribe than the Christian ones. But because the Christians had reached out to the rest of them, they thought we want to know more about these people. And currently there is three other churches being built in the area um, just because one man was willing to be used by God, connected with God every day by the Holy Spirit. He prayed and asked God for direction and together they are doing wonderful things for God. This is his wife and three little kids. So even though he's got a young family, when he first moved to the area, he just had um, one and I think one about to be delivered. Now he's got another baby. So this is his wife. She's a nurse and she helps with um, medical things at times. And this is Pastor Gideon Went, a mentor for God in this day and age. And so I pray that this week, God will, you will first of all make sure that you connect with God every day. Pray when, even when you're still on your mattress before you get up, just say, God, what do you want me to do today? And then 
take the Bible and ask him to direct you to one verse that will be meaningful to you. And then you will be ready to see how you can help to make a difference in this world. We're going to finish our service this morning by singing the song, I Shall Not Be Moved. God, we thank you for your word this morning that teaches us how to be, how to live that will be a blessing to other people. Thank you for the story of Elisha, that wonderful leader who was able to bring even teenagers to a knowledge of you and to love you. I pray this week that you will help us to keep our eyes open for those around us, even family members, teenagers, who might be encouraged by our leadership. Thank you too for Pastor Gideon in New Guinea who is doing a great work for you and I pray that this week in Port Augusta we might spend each morning at the beginning of the day to pray and to be connected to you, to ask for your leading and then to do what you would want us to do that will bring people to love you and to serve you. We're looking forward to you coming soon and uh, we thank you and we just want to say we love you in the name of Jesus our Saviour. Amen.